Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's guest producer Noel over there, so this is Stuff You Should Know. Yeah, Noel elected to sit in on this one and not just hit record and run screaming. Yeah, <laughs> we were kind of surprised. Yeah. It's, it's weird, though. It's been so long since we had someone in here with us. I know. It's been the ghost the studio that time forgot. Yeah. Like we have to suck in our guts again. Nah, I gave up Sit upright. That. I have to lick my fingers in the... Straighten my hair uh-huh. with them. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chuck. Yes. You are a Gen Xer. Did you know that? Yeah, so are you. Yeah, that was my next point. Oh, okay. Sorry. I am too. Yeah. Uh, Noel, I think, is a millennial. Noel, God. what year were you born? 83. Noel's a millennial. Yep. God knows what Jerry is. No idea. Yeah, she's of her own time. Sure. <laughs> um. So... What none of us are, Jerry might be, I don't know, are baby boomers. Now, Jerry, you know Jerry's a Gen Xer. I'm just teasing. Yeah, one thing that uh, this inspired me to do was to do a show on generations, period. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating how people are grouped and also a little frustrated when, um, once I got into the subgroups, it helped me. Sure. But when I looked at, like, Especially the baby boom generation, there's such a clear difference in the which we'll get to the early and the later uh, part of that. Right. It was just like, well, why why don't you just call them two different generations? Some people do. Yeah. Well, some mind. people do, but mo- for the most part, they don't. For the most part, people say the baby boomers are people who were born from 1946 to 1964 is the general definition of them. Yeah, it's just weird. Like, my mom missed out on it just by a couple of years, but then my sister just missed out on it by a couple of years. Right. So it just doesn't seem like... I know they're not the same generation, but they sh- it, it's not even close. It shouldn't be. No, it's not. And and again, like, so we'll, we'll, t- we'll get into it a little bit more, but um, some people say that's just too wide of a swath. And more to the point, which th- this is the basis of generations, the life experience of those, of the people on either end of that that 20 year or so spectrum are so we're so wildly different that yeah they don't they can't be in the same generation it just doesn't make sense because the point of a generation um is that it is a group of people born around the same time who all shared some sort of major life experience a collective life experience yeah whether it's culture or like, ideologies yeah usually an event though like the assassination of jfk is sure. a big go-to for baby boomers yeah that it, it and the event was so enormous that it shaped their worldview for the rest of their lives yeah like ours would be the where's the beef commercials right <laughs> exactly uh well we do share that though oh no i'm i, I was dead serious oh, were okay. you not <laughs> well, I don't know if that's the identifying for mo- for event. well for millennials, um, especially older millennials, it would be like nine eleven. Sure, would be that for ours, maybe Challenger. The Challenger explosion is the one I always go to. Does it always have to be a disaster? No, it's just got to be a, a, an enormous event that enough people are aware of and impacted by that it shapes who they are. So it's almost like a group of people all about the same age, all being touched in uh, relatively the same way at the same time so that their worldview is changed forever by that event. So where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Glad we agree. Yeah. Uh, so the reason um, there were a lot of – well, the deal with the baby boomers is, as you'll see, is that there are a lot of them. And birth rates rose quite a bit in 1946 and stayed that way for about 20 years. And it's interesting when you look at the reasons. Um, the most obvious thing you can point to is just say, like, yeah, dudes came home after the war and had a lot of sex. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Right. That has something to do with it, but this article points out something I never considered, which was sort of a convergence of uh, of that, and then not just wanting to have a lot of sex after the war, but right. the promise of like prosperity to come after the war, and like things are going to be great, so let's like go all in on the family. Uh, but that converging with the uh, a, a bit of an older generation of parents post depression right. that may have waited to have kids. Right. 
for various reasons, and that kind of all happening at the same time. Yeah, younger families having kids not postponing, the older generation that had postponed right. having the kids all at the same time. Huge, huge population increases. From 19, uh, 1950 to 1980, the American population increased by 50%. That's nuts. From 1946 to 1945, the number of babies born year over year increased by 20%. That's that's a that's a lot. Yeah, so in 1946 millions, I think about an average of 4 4 million and change babies started being born every year. Yeah. And it kept going and going until I think 1957 when it plateaued uh-huh. and stayed high for a while. Yeah. And then it dipped again starting in 1964-65. Yeah. Which coincided with the um, widespread availability of the pill. Right. Uh, one reason I think the baby boom generation is so interesting and endlessly talked about and studied is because it just, the the shift, the ideological shift that they were presiding over mm-hmm. is it was, was just massive. Uh, this article kind of sums it up nicely. Like they created the youth movement of the 60s when they were in their 20s it was that culture excess of the 70s. Mm-hmm. And then in the 80s, they became the yuppies. And now they're entering retirement or in retirement and running the world. Running the world. And then as, into the ground. And then, <laughs> and then, as you'll see, a lot of them are rebuffing the excess of, hey, let's make and spend tons of money. Right. And like concentrating on giving back. Which was originally inspired by like the Kennedy administration volunteerism. Yeah, that that uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Yeah, thing. Yeah, that whole thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's interesting. This one lady, the first millen- or I'm sorry, the first uh, boomer, born just after midnight in New Jersey, uh, Kathleen Casey Kirschling, is widely regarded as the first baby boomer. Yes, yeah, she was born January first, nineteen forty six. Yeah, and as you'll see. If you look at her life, she really is like a symbol. And, of course, you know, that's kind of the problem with generations is you lump them all in as this. And, of course, it varies from person to person. Well, that's one criticism of even uh, studying generations in the first place. Yeah, yeah. But uh, she uh, was married for a time, Mm -hmm. uh, got divorced, um, has a self-made pension that she accrued over the years. Like, I'm going to take care of my own, you know, retirement. Doing appearances as the world's first baby <laughs> she, boomer. She missed out if she didn't. Slash bearded lady. Uh, and then like had a career, a successful career as I think like a corporate trainer. Then in the early 90s, left corporate America and became a high school teacher for like 15 or 20 years. She Yeah, she basically read a book on how to be yeah. a typical baby boomer. It's interesting. And Sounds now like, like splits time between Maryland and Florida and has concentrated uh, on volunteerism in her retirement. That's really neat. Yeah, it's like she's kind of the prototypical boomer of, if you want to buy into that thing. Yeah, uh, traditional into non-traditional family structure, family life, right? Yeah. Career, took care of her uh, her own retirement, uh-huh. and then during retirement chose not to actually just retire, yeah. but to stay active and, and engaged. Yeah. That is it's pretty typical boomerism. <laughs> boomerism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should we hit people over the head with some of these stats? Yeah, I mean, they were pretty interesting. Like, I guess just because they came at a really interesting time in America's history, like the boomers started to be born at the same time as the suburbs. Yeah. The consumerism, American consumerism, all really started with the baby boom generation. Yeah, like they, they, were the, they felt really good about spending money on themselves. They were the first children targeted by advertisers. Yeah. Remember the advertising of kids that started with the boomers? Yep. Um, everything changed around that time, um, and, and in part because of the baby boomers. So they're probably the most studied generation in American history. Yeah, so there are more California boomers than any other state. Uh, I think Utah has the fewest amount of boomers. But they still had like 23% of their their uh, population was baby boomers. Yeah, but they're the only one that was under 25%, right? Right. Uh, what else? 12.6% of boomers never got married, which is uh, from their parents' generation, only 3.9% never got married. So that's a pretty big increase in sure. shunning nuptials. I wonder what it is now. I couldn't find it. I don't know. It, it's just increasing, I'm sure. 
what people getting oh choosing not to get married mm-hmm. right or or living a, a non traditional or maybe it's traditional now even right like we're just together we're just not married right partnerships um what else I mean we could read out stats all day but that's boring I thought you loved doing that <laughs> nah I'm oh, over okay. It. Fine. Well, there were there were two things that really stood out to me, though, and they, they go hand in hand. 40% of baby boomers expected their adult children to move back in with them. Yeah. <laughs> and then 30% expect their parents to move in with them. And for some of those people, that overlaps. One of the oh, precarious wow, yeah. positions that some boomers find themselves in is caring for adult children and um, aged parents at the same time under the same roof. Yeah, and I, th- I posted something a while ago on Stuff You Should Know's Facebook page, and um, something about kids moving back in, and people were like, oh, what a bunch of losers. And then so many people from all over the world were like, you know, America is like the only country that feels that way, like that families should leave at a certain age and not come back. <laughs> and they're like, all over the world, people are like, you know, we think it's a great thing. Family's huge, and we welcome family to live with each other. And you know, into their twenties or thirties, if they want to. Huh? That's like, bizarre. We help each other, rely on each other. Yeah, isn't it weird? Because the, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess the rest of the world doesn't know. We in America, when you turn eighteen, they have a see you in hell party. Yeah. <laughs> where you leave and um, you're not allowed to come back into the house uh-huh. until you, well, until your parents are dead. What we call it a hit the bricks party. Oh, well, you Same were thing. yeah, Baptist family. <laughs> That's right. Now that we're making stuff up, do you think we should take a break? Yeah, let's uh, let's do some real research and come back and do this again. <laughs> okay. Hey, buddy, let's talk about Blue Apron. Blue Apron. If you haven't heard by now, Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country, and they basically make cooking at home a pleasure and a wonderful experience. Yeah, it's their mission to make incredible home cooking accessible to everybody, and they've got it down pat, dude. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. And because it's all pre-portioned and well thought out, that means there's little to no food waste, which is wonderful. That's right. And we're talking really yummy stuff. Like uh, the other day I had some of that spinach and fresh mozzarella pizza with olives, bell peppers, and a ricotta salata. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash stuff. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All right, Chuck, so the baby boomers were, until very, very recently, the biggest generation population-wise to ever um, ever hit America. And they hit America by, they hit us like a brick, <laughs> a ton of bricks. Yeah, but millennials, are, they're taking over now, right? Yeah, millennials just surpassed um, the boomers in number, from what I understand. Yes, millennials, uh, as of 2015... Of course, that number has grown now. Uh, 75.4 million, mm-hmm. uh, just edging out 74.9 million baby boomers. But here's the thing. Millennials are still being born. Boomers are dying. Yeah. The boomers, actually, here's here was something um, that I just thought was amazingly interesting. The uh, baby boomers peaked fairly recently as far as their numbers go. They peaked in 1999 at 78.8 million. Wow. Right? And our generation is going to peak next year. Ooh. So if all the signs and symptoms that you personally are dying That's true. and I'm dying yeah. weren't enough, yeah. our whole generation's now dying. Yeah. We're going to decline after next year. Yeah. I think more and more about that. About our generation peaking in 2018? No, about me dying. I know what you mean. Like I, I never thought I would be that guy that, um, you know, that just sort of like that whole Woody Allen obsessed with your own death thing. Are you obsessed? No, but... It's healthy to think about the fact that you're going to die. 
Probably so. Some some people believe, including me, that accepting, genuinely accepting your own death is the key to living fully. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the struggle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you can throw that on a t-shirt, but... <laughs> sure. No, I know. Sometimes I'm like, I wonder if, if it just hasn't fully sunk in yet, and one day down the road I'm going to be like, I'm going to die... I think uh, this has come more and more for me in the past five years, so I'll check back in with you in five years. Okay, do. If I'm alive. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be bad. That'd be really sad. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yes, it would, Chuck. (laughs) It'd be sad for at least three people that I know, and you're one of them. Thanks, man. Um, So I was talking earlier about the boomers, that age range is too big, and it needs to be split up, and turns out it has been. Uh, Generally... If you look at 1946 to 54, people refer to that as the leading edge of the boomers. Mm -hmm. And 55 and 64 as shadow boomers or Generation Jones. Yeah. Did you look into that? Yeah. I mean, the name was the first thing. I was like, well, where did that come from? And apparently there's a few different things. Either like uh, they were jonesing for prosperity of like days to come more so than the the leading edge. Yeah. They had... Just as high expectations, if if not higher than the first, the first batch, but fewer resources available to them. Yeah, it's a weird name. So they they apparently were considered to be more cynical, more bitter. Yeah. Than the first batch of baby boomers. Yeah. And then um, also their life experiences, again, like we were, we were talking about earlier, are so different that um, that there it's just a, a different generation. Everybody's just being stubborn. And wants baby boomers to be this 20-year generation rather than 10. Well, yeah, but you were talking about the, the life events or whatever, the binding life events. Uh, these two writers, uh, Howard Schumann and Jacqueline Scott in the mid-'80s, kind of did a little bit of research on what they feel like is the, the what people feel like is their defining thing from their generation. Right. And it is sharply divided. When you have the leading edge, you've got, obviously, uh, – JFK, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, a lot of assassinations. Right. Uh, the Moonwalk, uh, Vietnam War, Civil Rights Movement, and then the more cynical um, Shadow Boomers or or Joneses. Uh, you're talking Nixon and Watergate, the Cold War, the oil embargo. It it sort of makes sense. It's definitely two like those are two pretty starkly different sets of events they took that yeah they are it's like almost a different world that happened that took places along that change along that divide america switched gears in large part oh yeah agreed and you asked earlier if it always has to be a disaster yeah i mean all of these basically are pretty glum yeah and gloomy i think disaster unites though that's probably a big thing that but also i think it leads to a loss of innocence which happens on a personal level as well right, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of when you grow up is when you realize oh my god everything isn't totally stable and my parents can't solve every problem in the world yeah. and there's like real strife and hardship and injustice and 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 bleakness yeah and when you realize that, suddenly say something like the, this president you idolize being assassinated, yeah. it, can, it can have a real s- solidifying effect on your, your life, your outlook. Yeah, for, you mentioned the challenger for us, and I'm in no way like downgrading that, but for me personally, it, and it might have just been the way I received the news even, mm-hmm. it wasn't like, uh, I don't feel like it like, was the big defining thing. Oh, okay. Like it was obviously a big deal, but did you see it happen? No, nah, I don't think I saw it happen live, which mm. probably is a, a big sure. factor. Um, but like Reagan being assassinated is rings more in my head, at least as a memory. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it affected me as much personally, mm-hmm. but like when I think back, like what big thing in the childhood happened on an international stage? Like I like remember where I was when Reagan was shot. Yeah, and I don't remember the Challenger as much, which is weird because it was later. Yeah, I was only like. Five when Reagan was shot. I don't have any memory of it whatsoever. Right. You didn't care. I didn't know. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what was no, going on. five-year-old doesn't care. I guess not. You're playing with your G.I. Joes. That's right. Uh, but as the article points out, one thing that united all boomers was TV. Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking about how – and we should, we should give credence or um, – 
props, I guess, to the guy who came up with the concept of generations. It was a sociologist named Carl Mannheim, and he wrote The Problem of Generations um, back in 1923. Oh, wow. And basically said, this is the thing now. I, I'm Carl Ma- Mannheim. Good night. And in it, he says, like I was saying before, that a generation is is held together by the shared experience that they all go through together. Um and up until television, I mean, you had radio, you had newspaper, you had a guy on horseback running around from town to town shouting news or whatever. But when, with the invention of television, like now you have this really powerful way for people to share the same thing at the same time. Yeah. Because they were getting the news in exactly the same way. Yeah. Through television, where a generation really could be solidified and defined into an actual group that had a lot in common because of this event. Well, yeah, and not just news, but just culturally, like the first generation that sat around and watched TV shows, yeah, yeah, uh, together, like that, and music were like the two biggest things culturally. I mean, you can, I mean, obviously, you can talk about the frisbees and hula hoops and Barbie dolls and stuff like that, uh-huh. but um, TV and music, like the birth of rock and roll, well, yeah, and the birth of television, are like the two hugest things for sure. Yeah. Elvis, the Beatles. Those were very much in the the wheelhouse of the boomers. Yeah. So you've got those things. You've got the the what they were like. You were saying you got the fact that they can be shared easily by a number of far flung people all over the country of the same age. Yeah. You got yourself a generation, buddy. Yeah, and then the the final little piece there is the skepticism of that generation. I think was a really big um, uniting factor. Like. Boomers were the people who said, don't trust anyone over 30. Yeah. And the whole Nixon, Watergate, the Vietnam War being played out every night on TV. It was like that led to like political revolution in this country, I think, because of that skepticism. Yeah, but it's interesting. Rather than saying like their generations of, of parents before them, well, this is just the way they things are. Yeah. Can't do much about that. Right. Um, this generation was among the first to say, no, we we reject this way of looking at things and we seek to rebuild these institutions in a way that more reflect how we think the world should work. That's yeah. hu- That was a huge hallmark of the baby boomer generation. Yeah, it's weird, though, when you look at all this stuff, like they were the most selfless in a lot of ways, but also the most selfish generation in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Like at the, the same whole, time. That whole 80s yuppie thing? Yeah, the me generation. Sure. And the consumerism like was hand-in-hand hand with the birth of feminism, or maybe not birth, but at least rebirth of feminism mm-hmm. and uh, the civil rights movement. Like It's really interesting that all those things like were wrapped up in this one generation. Well, similarly, though, too, they were also very political and then apolitical, depending on the decade. You know, like they were members of organized student groups in the late 60s. Yeah. And then by, you know, a decade later, they were all like doing coke and turning their back on politics while they were right. like disco dancing, you know? You're like, hey, money. That's actually kind of cool if you have it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it was uh, it, like it was. they've gone through huge shifts and, and sociologists have run after them, studying them the whole time. Yeah. Uh, politically... It's sort of hard to lump uh, the baby boomer generation politically because, and I think this could probably be said of most generations, but they're really hard to pin down. Uh, so this is an old survey, but in 2004, uh, AARP did one that um, found out that baby boomers supported abortion rights and gun control, stem cell research, but they also uh, supported the death penalty and being more conservative uh, fiscally and like sort of all over like all over the map politically what's what's funny is i saw like there's this actual sentence in this article it's very difficult to pin boomers down as being either liberal or conservative and i went huh and typed into google found immediately a a 2014 gallup poll it said nope 40 44 percent conservative 21 percent liberal (laughs) oh really yeah of of baby boomers yeah interesting self-reported on a poll so that's uh, what two thousand fourteen sixty five percent total. Yeah. So the other don't aren't. The other rest were like, if if you can remember the sixties, you weren't there. <laughs> and the the uh, pollster was like, uh, sir, I didn't ask you about the sixties. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, 
And we talked a little bit about consumerism, but that was a, a also a really big uniting factor was this was the first generation that really went all in on saying it's okay to spend money on yourself. You don't have to feel bad about it. Uh, you know, those previous generations were of that depression era were like, right. you know, you don't just do things like that. Don't throw that safety pin away. You can fix that. Yeah. A it's penny, not broken. A penny saved is a penny earned, whereas the boomers were like, a penny saved is one you could be spending on something cool. Right. <laughs> uh, what's interesting is that it's it's come back again. Like that level of thriftiness we're in the we're in the midst of right now. You think? Uh, I didn't live through the depression. True. Yes. But I yeah, w- compared to even ten fifteen years ago, pre pre recession mentality, uh, th- what we're in right now is definitely thriftier. Interesting. Um. Yeah. And um. Yeah. Same thing though. Great depression. Great recession. Yeah. Has a tendency to bring out the thriftiness in people. Um. We were talking about politics, though, too. So the first baby boomer president was Bill Clinton. Yeah, Billy. And then George W. was the second baby boomer president. Uh-huh. Uh, and then it went to Generation Jones with Obama. Right, yeah. He, he was the first Joneser. But baby boomer. Yeah, but really Generation Jones. Okay. Really. So Billy and George were in the leading, right. the leading edge. Yeah, they were both born in 1946. Okay. Obama was Generation Jones, and then the next guy is, uh, he was born in 1946 as well. So it went back to baby boom after Obama. Oh, interesting. And this, well, I don't know. You never know what's going to happen in 2020, but you would think that not even just the presidency, but in, in all of politics, that they will obviously they will be phased out with time but i wonder if there will be another president from that generation uh i don't know although joe biden just said don't count him out for 2020 and he's he'll be 80 then really yeah he's got a lot of vim and vigor though he does but boy 80 i mean not to knock any 80 year old listeners out there well bernie was 81 i think he would have been just fine yeah that's true 80's the new 60 well, I hope so. <laughs> All right, let's take a break and um, and maybe continue with this afterward, huh? <laughs> I think we should. All right. We've got to finish. Let's do it. Chuck, you've perfected your wardrobe. Eh, you might say that. But what about the things that most people don't get to see? Your undies. That's right. Uh, my friend, I've elevated my underwear to the next level with me undies. Because let me tell you, if you've been to the big box store and you settled for store-bought underwear and the five-pack, mm-hmm. we need to tell you that me undies will change your life for the better. Yeah, what is me undies? Oh, just seriously soft, feel good undies delivered right to your door. And me undies are designed in LA. That means Los Angeles, not Louisiana. Yeah, and they're made from sustainably sourced micro modal. And brother, let me tell you, that stuff is super soft. In fact, it's a fabric three times softer than cotton. Woo, and guess what? You can save time and money each month right now with a monthly subscription. And if you're not ready to commit to something as big as a subscription, that's okay. You can still save because MeUndies is offering you 20% off your first pair. Just use our special URL, MeUndies.com slash stuff, and you'll get 20% off your first pair. So go ahead, revamp your underwear drawer because you deserve it. Once again, that's MeUndies.com slash stuff. <laughs> So, Chuck, one of the things about a baby boom is that um, they're significant in that it's a sudden influx of a lot of kids being born at the same time. Yeah. And the reason it's significant is because previous to that and then usually after that, there's fewer kids being born. So it's a bulge in your population, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that means that that population is eventually going to grow old, and as they grow old... They are going to need more 
social services that you have reserved for the elderly, for the aged in your population, right? Yeah, I mean, not only that, the other side is is the healthcare sector, period, whether or not it's, we're talking like Medicare and Social Security and stuff, but mm-hmm. just healthcare, period, in the private sector is like licking their chops. Oh, yeah, it's going to be... the money to be made and is being made. It's going to be a, a big boom for yeah. the healthcare sector. And it has been booms for all these, for several other sectors along the way as they've aged yeah. and matured and then now they're looking to health care more and more um it's it's not going to be just like a a sickness bonanza for the health care industry because the the one of the hallmarks of the baby boomer generation is they were one of the first to like really take care of themselves yeah much healthier like i remember when we were younger like a 65 year old was like an old person like they might be on oxygen. Yeah, they were they were not in good shape by their mid sixties. You know, like eight now sixties, like they're doing one handed push ups <laughs> in the street and stuff like that. That was the result of the baby boomers doing things like taking up jogging. Yeah, um, like eating uh, v- vegetarian, like just ge- generally taking better care of themselves, having an emphasis on that. Yeah, so they're not going to just all start getting sick on mass. Yeah, like the boomers. Or, no, I'm sorry, previously the boomers, they were like, well, what kind of steak do you want tonight? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, what cut of beef? I want steak stuffed with steak. <laughs> oh, man, I just listened to uh, a Mark Maron episode with David Spade, and he was talking about Farley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said that Chris Farley would put a, a new full pat of butter on every bite of steak that he ate. Oh, that doesn't sound very tasty. Well, butter on steak is delicious. You yeah, me? but it, that much butter on each bite, that's too much. Yeah. And that's, I, you might even say that's excessive. <laughs> and uh, Spade would get on and be like, dude, you can't do that. And he said Farley would look at him and go, he's like, but each one needs its own hat. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he couldn't help but laugh because he was just so adorable and stuff <laughs> like that. each one needs its own hat. <laughs> man, what a loss. Oh, I'm just so sad, man. Yeah. Like, he, they, he talked a lot about it. It was really interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. yeah. I love those two together. Yeah, very sad. Um, not to bring everything down. But you did. <laughs> but we were talking about them aging and... And, uh, and being healthier, yeah. Yeah, they are uh, aging in a much healthier manner than previous generations. But they still will need health care. And these social services that are available, specifically like Medicare for health care yeah. and Social Security... For retirement pensions, yeah. So what's the deal? Are scared? They're they're like no, no. I, I started no. to look into it, but I got depressed, and but then I also saw that like no, we saw this coming, so they have taken measures. Yeah, I saw in a couple places that it's the most predictable train wreck in American history. Okay, well that's good and bad. So here's the thing: when you're working, you're contributing to Social Security. It comes yeah. out of your paycheck, right? Yeah. That goes into a poorly managed fund. Um, that loses money very quickly, right? So um, it was in grave danger of really running out uh, in the not too distant future, decades in the not back. Too distant past. And in 1984, yeah, uh, there was a payroll tax increase uh-huh. that created a reserve fund. And uh, 1984 means that it was a Ronald Reagan tax increase, right? Sure. So this reserve fund is still around. I think there's like 2.6 trillion dollars in it. Right. But we are depleting it each year, and it's it makes up the shortfall that that Social right. Security is is lacking, right? So as we deplete it more and more, um, well, we have less and less money to provide for people down the road. Mm-hmm. And they think by twenty thirty four we'll just be back to just Social Security. The the reserve fund will be depleted, and we'll be able to offer something like seventy to eighty percent of the benefits that's coming to each person. That's a big shortfall. In other words, hey, what you thought you were going to get, you're going to be short 20 to 30%. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. So people are like, what do we do? Right. It turns out there's a lot of very, not painless, but not painful at all measures that you can pick from and put together. Uh I saw this great Forbes article on it. They had like an infographic, so it really drove it home. (laughs) Yeah. But it was like pick pick three of these, pick two of these, pick five of these, pick 10 of these. Uh And like they were just um, 
increasingly smaller and smaller, less noticeable measures mm-hmm. that you could take and make up 100, 120, 130 percent of the shortfall in Social Security. Just by moving money around? Yeah. Yeah. It, or just slightly increasing these taxes, uh-huh. slightly slashing benefits, slightly making the age of retirement a little longer just a set little, of or a little older. Yeah. Yeah. That, that altogether, the average person wouldn't even notice, really. Right. right? Um, so I'm I'm sure that we're going to be able to figure it out in a way that's not going to just ruin everything. That's good. The the thing that's keeping it from really going downhill though is that the baby boomers seem to have said, "I can't retire." Right. So in 2008, that Great Recession that happened, there was a massive transfer of wealth out of the real estate holdings and the stock portfolios of. Americans. Yeah. A lot of them were baby boomers who were poised to retire. They lost a lot of money. It went elsewhere. Yeah. Right? Um, and as a result, the baby boomers just said, well, I have to go back to work. Or, well, I was going to retire, but I'm going to have to keep working for five more years. Yeah. Um, and that mentality seems to be keeping uh, Social Security from being further strained. They're just not – they're not – they're working longer than they they normally would be expected to under Social Security. Yeah, it says here the Congressional uh, Budget Office said that 25% of boomer households don't have enough savings put away to retain their standard of living upon retirement. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are also a large set of boomers that uh, want to stay active and keep working. Like I think it said something like 17% only 17% are expected to fully retire and be done working. And not all of them are because they need the money. Right. Um, it sort of depends. Some, I mean, it's kind of sad. Some people have been forced out of their jobs and at a late stage in life or later stage in life have to go back to like these hourly jobs. And other people are choosing to. They're like, you know what? I want to go work in a wine shop and yeah. make, you know, 12 bucks an hour. It, and Or like um, the first baby boomer. Uh, chose to go teach high school at, uh, as her second career. Yeah, and is now full in on volunteerism. Right. So, um, yeah, there are there's it it there's definitely both going on. Again, you can't paint that generation with just one brush, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for using that that metaphor. Ugh. What you don't like that? No. Painting with a brush? No. Why do you hate art? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that one guy? Yeah, man. But there are plenty of people who just simply can't afford to. And that, to me, is just really, really sad, especially if the reason is, is that their their 401Ks just lost value or their house isn't worth what they were planning on, and that yeah. was their nest egg. That is really sad to me. It is. Um, I, we don't give advice much, but I think millennials have, are much better about trying to think about their long-term financial future than our generation. Mm-hmm. Um because I didn't think about that stuff till just far too late. Yeah. But um taking it very seriously now, but my advice to younger people is just like just start early dudes and dudettes yeah. with with small contributions even. Uh talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Uh like who knows what's going to happen. Like don't depend on social security. Like take care of yourself. Yeah, oh yeah. With safe investments and you know, not be like, yeah, dude, I got it covered, you know, my brother's going to st- Open up some uh, some pay lots. I'm, I'm going all in on his parking lots. I think that might work out, but try try some nice, safe investments, long term stuff. Well, diversify. Yeah. If don't put all, <laughs> don't put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> or in that pay lot. Right. Exactly. Which now just occurred to me that was the Fargo. Uh, that was what he wanted the money. Oh, for. is that what it was? Yeah, he wanted to buy some parking lots. Yeah. A real rich deal, Stan. Yeah. Man, what a good movie. <laughs> so I have. I know you're off of stats these days, but I have some that I feel are worth sharing. Okay. I'm just going to go sit outside. I got these from The Motley Fool, and they're depressing. So 59% of baby boomers expect to rely heavily on Social Security. 59? That's up from 43% in 2014. So more are counting on that now? Yeah. I would have thought that would go down. No, things are not going well right now. 45% have no retirement savings. Wow. None anymore. They may have had it before. They don't have it now. They never saved whatever. That's up from 20% who said that in 2014. Wow. So things are tanking for the baby boomers right now. 
Twenty-six percent expect to wait until seventy to retire. Thirty percent stopped adding to the retirement uh, assets in two thousand sixteen. Yeah, sixteen percent had had taken premature withdrawals. Forty-four percent were in debt, with a median debt of twenty-four thousand five hundred dollars. Man, yeah, this is not how we should care for our aged population. No, you know, it's not. And then to, you couple the fact with like that's great. You're gonna expect to rely heavily on Social Security. You're gonna be disappointed. But do you just go ahead and report that to any guy who asks you with the poll? Yeah. The yeah. other the other big uh, misconception is um, that the boomers work harder than uh, the millennials or Gen Xers. Um, uh, yeah, their Protestant work ethic that they're yeah. famous for. And you found this cool thing. This guy uh, at Wayne State, Keith uh, Zabel, uh, he examined 77 studies comprising 105 distinct measurements of work ethic. And he basically said... That's all just a bunch of junk that you read in uh, Salon or Slate. <laughs> He's like, if you look at the numbers and the stats, there is no difference in work ethic between the generations. Yeah. Which is interesting. It and, is and interesting. It, and it feels right. You know, like it just feels like just something that some editor wants to write about and assigns it. Like that's a hot topic. Well, apparently that's a big like human resource thing too is figuring out how to structure a corporation to – squeeze the most out of each of the generations yeah. working there. And this guy's saying like don't even bother. They they're all they all work the same. Yeah. Although they did say that um that baby boomers tend to thrive more in um well they subscribe to organizational structure more. Yeah. So hierarchies whereas like millennials and generation X are more like, eh, let's do some more work from home." Yeah. How about that? Or how about a big huge cavernous office with no walls. Right. We're all the same. And can we get some butter for our steak <laughs> around here? How about a standing desk? You know why? Because sitting is for chumps and Gen Xers. You remember that whole period? <laughs> what do you mean? Here in our own office? Yeah. Yeah, they're... Oh, yeah, some people still do that. The yeah. weirdos. Yeah, but I've also seen uh, more stools in here Gross. than ever before. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you Tall mean. stools, sitting stools. I see. Uh, what else? Apparently the boomers are uh, really the first big generation to um, robustly v uh, opt for cremation upon death and not have this uh, morose, open casket, traditional sad funeral and be more like, <laughs> I want to die as I lived with verve and vigor and let's, have a, let's have a party, man. Scatter my ashes on the White House lawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it cost to hire Gallagher? I wonder. Eh, probably not <laughs> that much these days. He's I'll bet he still tours too. Oh, I'm sure he does. I bet he's. I bet he's got his own place in Branson. Uh he's a little too hip for Branson. Right between Yakov and Inkelbert Humperdinck. Yeah. You got anything else? Um, I don't think so. Oh well, I did think it was interesting the um the big suburban boom that came with the millennials or with the uh I keep saying that, I don't know why. I'm like skipping Gen X altogether. Well, <laughs> that's the curse of our generation. Uh the big su suburban boom uh with the boomers, mm -hmm. they uh in the 1950s, you know, all these it became cheaper basically to move outside the city in in the tiny apartment. And like buy an actual home with a backyard, and that's when the suburbs really boomed. And apparently, it had a had quite a deleterious effect on women. Uh, the women who moved to the suburbs, it was they were sort of in a weird way taught like, "Hey, go back to that thing where you you don't want to work. You want to just be a mom out in the suburbs and raise your kids." Yeah, like I that's see, the thing to do. Same revolutionary road. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Depressing movie. Oh my god. Um, but uh, apparently, it generated a, uh, that dissatisfaction is what led to um, the women's rights movement. Like that dis dissatisfaction well, the, turned it into feminism were, of the '60s. Right, right. Because I mean, there were plenty of women's rights movements before, like with oh, the yeah. suffrage and, um, well, with suffrage. Yeah. <laughs> this this uh, revived it big time. Just living in the suburbs did it. Ha it had such a crushing effect on women. 
living in the suburbs, isolated from the city, yeah, from other people, from social networks, and living in this place where they were expected to just basically raise kids and keep the uh, house clean. Yeah. It's yeah, pretty this- neat how things like produce like opposite equal and opposite reactions you know yeah this lady betty frieden in uh, 1963 in her book the feminine mystique said that the suburbs were burying women alive and that's a very harsh way to put it but it certainly drives it home oh yeah yeah i find that interesting we need to do a feminism one sometime uh, i do have one more on uh baby boomers smoking um grass okay Apparently they like it. <laughs> it was one of the three things you could give for a ride. Yeah. <laughs> Gas and one other one. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's still, to me, one of the all-time great bumper stickers. Sure it is. It's just so good. Uh, this man, Benjamin Hahn, he's a doctor, a geriatrician, and health services researcher at the Center for Drug Use. And uh, he led a study called The Demographic Trends Among Older Cannabis Users in the United States. Mm-hmm. 2006 to 2013. It's kind of wordy. But um, he evaluated close to 50,000 adults, 50 and older, and found that 71% increase in marijuana use among adults age 50 and older between uh, 2006 and 2013. Which makes sense, these hippies getting older. Right. and, And it says here that they didn't start, like they just kept smoking grass. Right, they just aged into another... Age group. Yeah, they're not new users, but right. that fell off a lot uh, uh, after 65, a significantly lower prevalence of use, um, but still two and a half times higher over that eight-year period. Huh. So, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. They're... I've seen the same thing with STDs as well. Uh-huh. There's higher rates of STDs among older populations than before, and again, it's because the baby boomers are aging into these new age brackets. Yeah. Bringing all of their vices with them. Yeah, my friend... Um, well, I won't say any names, but I have a friend, and his wife has uh, her family in South Carolina has an island, uh, just one of these little coastal, you know, you, you, it's not like an island like you would think. It is an island, but it's not some big, huge thing. It's just a small, like, area of land on the in the on the waterways there. I, yeah, I get an island. On the Outer Banks. Gotcha. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> you got to see the place. You're it's like, like, it's a, it's land, but it's surrounded by water and all No, sides. but when you think like someone owns an island, you think of this big thing with like houses everywhere and like palm trees. I, well, the, the Outer Banks is like just tons of little islands, Tons right? of little islands. Yeah. So they own one of them. All right. And they have a little retreat there, which is basically a, a, a cabin with like eight bunk beds and then this huge just picnic area, like a, a covered picnic area and they have this retreat every year a couple of times a year and i've been on it and all these old south carolina hippies Mm -hmm. are all these kids parents and they put us to shame like we do they all get naked they like getting naked that age group they it was too cold to get naked Uh. but they uh they like we were in bed before they were (laughs) they were up again the next morning before we were and i remember like literally waking up hung over and like walking out to the fire and there was like seven 60 year olds with like three joints being passed around between them. Oh my God. You know, nine in the morning. Did you leave? And everybody else was asleep. And I was just like, what world have I stepped into here? <laughs> and these are the boomers. These are the, these are like these cool old hippies. Yeah. Martin Mull still fighting the power, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Martin Mull. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting. They're they're a fun group, I gotta say. Still fighting the power. Yeah, on a private island in South Carolina. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we could probably sit here and talk smack about baby boomers for a year or more. I love them. Yeah, they're great. Um, but we're going to stop, right? Okay. Okay. So uh, if you want to know more about baby boomers, well, stop a baby boomer in a grocery store and ask him about what it's like to be a baby boomer. <laughs> And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this uh, English sayings of sorts. Uh, Hey, guys, love the show. Uh, Enjoy the way you have uh, have a go at pronouncing things. You seem to enjoy being corrected on uh, these. So hold on tight. Uh, I was listening to the podcast on flea circuses, and you mentioned uh, mentioned Hertfordshire, England. (laughs) A couple of pointers. Hertfordshire is pronounced Hertfordshire. No, we were way off. 
Uh, I admit it, uh, it isn't spelled H-A-R-T, but then that is just the English language for you. Uh, the legendary ugh uh, that has many sounds like tough, cough, though, through. Uh, it can be a royal pain in the butt for everyone learning English, but uh, it must be a nightmare to learn English at a later age. Oh, uh, yeah. My free tip for you is that if you ever have to discuss a place called Lochborough in Leicestershire, Leicestershire, it's pronounced Loughborough in Leicestershire. Okay. Got it? Uh, Cambridge is not on Hertfordshire. It's in Cambridgeshire. That's a bit like saying Boston, New Hampshire. Close, but no cigar. So I guess we messed that one up, too. No, no. That guy got it wrong. I was saying it's spelled like Hertfordshire, so I'm sure it's pronounced Cambridge. Oh. He wasn't listening. He didn't get the joke. No. Gotcha. It was a little esoteric. It was a little American. <laughs> anyway, guys, love the podcast. I'm currently going through your back catalog, which he spelled with a G-U-E. Uh, and it wiles away the boring drive to work each day across Cambridgeshire. Our differences are so vast. Yeah. How will we all ever get along? That's Ian Rose. Thanks, Ian. Or Ian Rose. Or, or Ian Rose. Rose, there you go. <laughs> Uh, if you want to get in touch with us like Ian or Ian did, uh, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 